Uh, Brad Adato, founder of Bird Adato, located in Dallas, Texas, but also offices in Chicago. You're listening to the interview with a surgeon with a surgeon agent. On this episode of Interview with the Surgeon, we welcome Brad Dotto, partner at Berta Dotto, a healthcare and business law firm based in Dallas with offices in Chicago. As the son of a medical doctor and grandson of a medical doctor, Brad has the healthcare industry in his blood. Brad's background is in regulatory, transactional, and securities law, having worked in healthcare law his entire career. Brad has worked with physicians, physician groups, and other medical services providers in developing ambulatory surgery centers, an office in freestanding ancillary service facilities, and other medical joint ventures. He regularly consoles clients with respect to federal and state healthcare regulations impact investments, transactions, and contract terms, including Medicare fraud and abuse, antitrust, anti-kickback, anti-referral, and private securities laws. Extensive transactional experience includes preparing and negotiating corporate and commercial arrangements, as certificates of formation, bylaws, shareholder agreements, set purchase agreements, physician employment agreements, recruitment agreements, and medical intellectual property mergers and acquisitions. Active in the healthcare community and often speaks at conferences, associations, and educational events. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining Interview with the Surgeon. Today, we welcome special guest Brad Adato, partner of Bird Adato Healthcare Law Firm based out of Dallas and Chicago. Brad, how are we doing today? I'm great, and thank you for having me. Um, and I'm excited to be part of a podcast that says uh, for the surgeon, so I'm glad to be a non-surgeon on your podcast. Appreciate that. So you know that we spoke to your partner, Michael Bird. We'd love to hear your thoughts on how Bird Adato got started. Yeah, absolutely. You know, both Michael and I, it's kind of a funny story. Both of us grew up as sons of physicians who were entrepreneurs. Uh, my dad started several businesses. So I knew that uh, early on that I did not want to be a doctor, but I love the business world and how, seeing how they did stuff. And both Michael and I, again, before we even met, we're both, uh, uh, we spoke a ton because education and educating others was kind of our, our, our core of how we spoke with uh, doctors and, and other clients. And so as we got to know each other and, and, and started working together and eventually, you know, we, we had the opportunities to speak nationally for years. We said, you know, we really realized that there was a, in the legal industry, there was a need for us, a boutique firm that, that was concentrating on business and healthcare. And then we decided to, to go off and, and a lot of people get, they hear healthcare like, oh, is that like malpractice? Like, no, 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 no. A hundred percent of what we do is business law, all the transactional side, but more than 75% of our clients are in the healthcare industry. And we're extremely uh, focused on the physician side. Um, and so when it comes to um, the physicians, a lot of them are, as you can imagine, are, are surgeons and, and other um, um, uh, skilled individuals, but they're all entrepreneurs in some capacity. And so it's a lot of fun um, being part of Bird Auto because every day we get to see something new and interesting that comes across the desk, mostly on the healthcare side, but still on the sense of these these great bright entrepreneurs with these ideas of starting uh, different products, different lines, and, and different types of um, uh, medical procedures. So it's a, it's a really cool area of law. Physicians often have other contracts provided to them outside of their employment agreement. What are some of the agreements that they might be seeing? Yeah. So I know that, you know, Michael, you've already done a podcast with him already. And, uh, you know, he's, he's talked a lot about, and, and you and I and Michael have all done many different uh, speeches on physician employment agreements, uh, the big five, which I know that a lot of physicians really like. So obviously I won't go into those, but you know, the first contract, and I, I actually remember my dad who, who's now retired, he still remembers the first employment agreement he ever received. Most docs will talk about that first physician em employment agreement and it's good, bad, or indifferent. They still remember it. They don't remember all the different other deals that come across the desk. And the reason why is they have so many different options that they get. I mean, it literally is the moment you graduate, people might start approaching you and start asking you, hey, would you be interested in doc and doing this or this and this? And, and some of those investments, as you can imagine, have nothing to do with um, the medical world. Um, you know, buying this property, buy this oil and gas company. Um, I have a doctor who owns a bunch of Burger Kings. All of those different things will, will go in different direction. But really what I think most doctors should be thinking about is you're going to have these medical opportunities that will come across. So the easiest one that most docs will see in their lifetime is become a medical director of a lab, imaging center, you know, ASC, you name it. But then they'll have lots of different ownership opportunities. And those ownership opportunities can be, you know, especially for the surgeons, ambulatory surgery centers or medical office buildings, um, maybe even uh, tapping into some anesthesia services, labs, imaging centers. Again, all, your specialty will really kind of 
push as to am I, you know, have an opportunity to invest in a med spa versus having an opportunity to invest in a physical therapy clinic. Um, every single one of these different opportunities are, are great, um, but again, um, what happens is uh, because of your specialty, because of what comes across your desk, um, these are going to be great opportunities for you to think about, but uh, you know, there's some other issues for them to be concerned about. So what are some of the mistakes that a physician makes when they enter into one of these agreements? You know, a lot of times they don't think about the unforeseen um, liability. And what I mean by that is, you know, for every physician, you need to know where, where you, the four different areas that you might be uh, attacked from in the sense of a liability. That's the government, number one. Number two is your patient. Number three is your partners. And number four is your employees. So any of those different um, capacities, uh, you know, as a physician, you need to be at least aware, those are your liability risks. And a lot of times when they, they get one of these ancillary deals that are brought to them, they're like, oh, I'm, I'm not worried about it. You know, it's a no brainer. It's a really easy. And they don't think about um, that. The fact is, look, you're in the healthcare industry and the healthcare industry is one of the most highly regulated industries in the United States. You have both federal and state and sometimes even county regulations that could um, control the way you run your business. And because of it, it's complicated and, and the complexity of it is trying to keep it simple, right? Because you want to be compliant, but that's the hard part about this particular in industry. And unfortunately, um, because there's so many rules and regulations and interpretations of those rules and regulations, it's really hard to be compliant. And so I think what, um, what a lot of physicians don't realize is that all of a sudden that they go and enter one of these ancillary deals and they don't realize that they're, they're subjecting themselves to all these rules I was just talking about um, and that you know, the enforcement actions that may come about because they aren't doing it correctly or even more that, that the fact is that the, 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 the actual government is out there looking at these deals. They think, oh, it's no big deal. It's just this one-off deal um, that my buddies you know, talked to me about and they just don't realize that risk. So that unforeseen liability is huge for them, especially when it comes to the government. Can you kind of talk on some of these rules that govern the ancillary agreements? Yeah, you know, and this is, uh, you know, this is one of those situations that, you know, I've been practicing over 20 years. And so when it comes to spotting these red flags in the few minutes that we have together, I won't be able to cover every single one of these rules. But I definitely for your audience, I want to kind of give them some highlights of some of the rules that they at least need to be aware of. And I promise as best I can, I won't go too in depth so that their eyes roll up and they they, they hurt their spine um, because their, their head rolled back so fast. Um, but in reality, the, the three major rules that you have to be aware of if you're going to go into, into a medical uh, ancillary agreement, so again, medical, is the anti-referral law, which a lot of physicians know as Stark, which is the federal version of the anti-referral law, the anti-kickback law, which, uh, um, and, then the, and then understanding your medical board. So I'll, I'll just briefly attack all three of those for your audience, which is the anti-referral law is all about you, the physician. It's, it's concentrating on you, the physician. Are you referring a patient to a facility in which you or your immediate family member has some type of financial relationship? And, I, and those, those sta that statement I just said, I probably could spend 35 minutes unpacking it. It's so in depth. But again, as a physician, if you are having these opportunities, again, I'm just trying to help you think of through, hey, this opportunity, I could refer patients there. Do I need to understand the anti-referral laws? And to be clear, yes, Stark is the federal law, but there are state laws, we call them baby Stark, but there are state laws that have the same issues when a patient is referred by a, ph a physician to a facility, they could be violating that law. law. The next one is called the anti-kickback law. And that's the best way to call that is just a kitchen sink it catches everything else. So you, the physician, can't be solicited or solicit someone for them to pay you some type of payment in kind or cash, directly or indirectly, um, for referring a patient to a facility. Meaning that, again, hey, doc, every single time you send someone over here, I'm gonna give you 25 bucks. I mean, that's the easiest one. Or you, the physician, say, hey, if I ever send someone there, you gotta pay me 25 bucks. That's the anti-kickback law. Um, there is a federal version of it, and I'd say the vast majority of states have some version of that, so you have to be very careful, um, no matter whether or not you have commercial payers, federal payers, or someone just paying you cash, of, of abiding by those rules. And finally, last but certainly not least, the ones that we actually see the most of 
is your medical boards. Look, you worked really damn hard to get your license and you need to think, make sure that you do anything, you, anytime you enter any arrangement um, that you're protecting your license. And medical boards um, dislike when you violate what they perceive to be federal or state law. So if you go look at your medical board rules, most states will say if you violated or perceived to have violated some of these rules, they can go after you for a host of reasons. And this is very, you know, there's objective reasons they can go after and there's subjective reasons. But the medical boards in most states, they have these little squishy areas, as I call it, which is, hey, did you act in a behavior that may have exposed the patient to unnecessary risk? So, you know, you're the, med you're the physician and you sent some patient to a facility that was not a good standing, but you sent them there because you're getting paid. The medical board could kind of go after, can and, and have, I've seen it before, after someone's license. Or you weren't following the standard of care um, by, by having some ownership in some entity. And finally, the easiest one, which is the, the catch-all, is you acted in some manner that was unprofessional or unethical behavior. So, you know, going down through that, the anti-referral law, the anti-kickback law, and then obviously your medical board. Of, of the three, the medical boards are the ones that we see the most of, but that's just because that's the easiest one to, for an investigation to get started compared to the anti-kickback and anti-referral. And look, and to be clear, um, you know, the, any, everything I just described to you is very fact dependent if you are going to go enter into one of these arrangements. And unfortunately, most clients say, hey, is this okay? And, 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 and I had to dive deeper saying, look, the facts and circumstances surrounding it is really what's most important. And, and a lot of ways we always talk about is either, you know, um, this risk tolerance discussion that we've had before, but there's also um, when it comes to analyzing um, whether or not something's compliant, um, again, I could bore your audience to death with the spectrum that we'd walk through, but think of it as, as a grayscale, right? The grayscale being black is illegal, or I like to say orange, you're wearing an orange jumpsuit because you did something, you know, completely wrong. And then the other spectrum is white. It's perfectly clean and clear. It's, you know, you can sing Don't Worry, Be Happy song over and over your head because you've met every element of what's needed. But unfortunately, the vast majority of deals that can be presented to um, these surgeons, these doctors, they're going to fall on that grayscale. And so you're going to have to find, um, which frustrates them all the time, by the way, because they're like, oh, Brad, I just I want to be easy. I'm like, I, I wish it was easy, but there is a gray area. And because of there's a gray scale and then in the gray area, we try to make sure that as best we can, we can put them in the most compliant situation. Now, with these rules being set by the government, do you not recommend a physician enter into these ancillary agreements? You know, it's funny. I gave a speech and afterwards I had a doc come up here and, and ask me almost that verbatim question saying like, so you're saying we should never do these deals. I was like, no, that's the no, opposite. Opposite of what I'm saying. We're business attorneys first. Um, meaning that we want to find a way to make these deals work, but we're healthcare attorneys in the sense that we want to make sure that they're compliant. So any way in which a, a physician can find a way to legally enter into an arrangement, we're for, um, which is why, you know, especially with surgeons, um, you know, their abilities to have all these other ancillary income. So again, think about it from this way. You're a doctor and you work really hard by performing a service that's, that's known as in the, in the industry, your professional service. You're in there operating there, you're seeing the patient, well, the only way you get paid is showing up and operating. With this ancillary income, you have the ability to tap into when you're not in the room, meaning so, hey, I own a piece of this ambulatory surgery center, and even when I'm not operating, one of my partners in there or another person I know is operating, and therefore I'm eventually getting paid even when I'm not in the room. So think about that, you know, physical therapy, or you're, own a, you're, being, you're owning the building, or you own a, a piece of the land itself, so you're getting paid on, on lease payments. Those are all legal ways that you, the physician, can get this ancillary income. Again, though, from where I started this, though, is it has to be compliant. So those terms and conditions, again, are really important. There are certain things that um, allow us to say, hey, yes, you're not going to violate Stark law, or you're not going to violate the anti-kickback safe harbor, but the government gives us these guidance of these are the rules that you have to play in. And that's why it's so important that we call it the form and substance rule, meaning that if someone comes along to you and says, hey, doc, I'm going to pay you $10,000 a month and you'll be my medical director, but you never have to do any work. And it just happens to be that you refer a lot of patients to that facility. You never have ever done anything. You've actually never been in the facility. That's a form and substance rule. The, the agreement itself could be the most beautiful written agreement ever written. Beautiful, it's, it's perfect, but you're not doing anything. And so that should be a red flag to the docs when, when they start hearing those kind of things. 
um, and, and obviously we deem them suspect. Doesn't mean it's illegal, but yes, first going to answer your question, yes, we absolutely encourage our clients to participate, but clearly we have to make sure that they're doing it in a compliant way. What are some of the biggest misconceptions a physician has when they approach an ancillary opportunity? I think a lot of times um, they think, well, and uh, this is, no, Brad, everybody's doing it. It's totally fine. I know like nine other docs are doing it and I'm, and I'm fairly confident they had their attorney look at it. Look, just because everyone's doing it doesn't make it legal. Um, we've, we've seen a lot of people get bitten on, on this and, and very large roll-up cases. And when, when everyone's doing it doesn't mean it's legal. Um, and I think a lot of it has to do with, you know, oh, my buddy's a, an attorney and, and, and they said it was okay. Or it's the whole, you've heard me say this before, the telephone game where somebody told someone it was high risk, but if they did it, these are the only ways they would agree to it. And then that doc told the next doc, oh, my, my attorney said it was okay, but it was a high risk. And then they tell the third doc, and they say, oh, it's perfectly legal. And so they, they had the telephone game where the actual d discussion that that attorney had, the very initial attorney that says high risk, but if there's no you know, Medicare or Medicaid patients, it's a lower risk because this state doesn't have an anti-kickback law, let's say. And they don't realize that they, they are, are putting themselves in a bad situation. And then going back to my buddy's attorney, look, at the end of the day, I'm not a criminal defense attorney. I'm not, I'm not a, a litigator. There are certain things I, I know very well. And so when you are working with, um, you know, it's, it's kind of like when you hear a doctor say, you know, well, you're an attorney, you should know all these different things. That's like saying, well, you're an orthopedic surgeon. And therefore, at the same time, you should be a great family physician, you know, family medicine physician. You know, they're, they're two different things. And that's where it comes to attorneys. We all fall in different areas where we, we're focused in. And so when you are talking to an attorney on a particular transaction, make sure that this is not their first rodeo, especially in healthcare deals. Because again, the, they, the, the misconception is, well, you're an attorney, so therefore you understand it. And the attorney's been practicing five minutes and their five minutes they've been practicing is all plaintiff's law, which has been suing people in car wrecks. Well, they're not gonna, unfortunately, I mean, no disrespect to plaintiff's attorneys, I have, so my best friends are, but um, it doesn't mean that they should be practicing in the healthcare spectrum. So that's kind of, I think one of the biggest issues I see. And unfortunately, and, and you probably heard me say this before, Matthew, I call it the 550 rule. You know, hire someone up front and pay them five bucks up front to do it correctly, or you're gonna hire a firm like ours afterwards and pay us 50 to fix it because um, the fixing is a lot harder uh, than doing it correctly up front. And that's where we, our firm gets pulled in a lot of medical board investigations or witnesses in other uh, transactions in other states when this comes up is because someone unfortunately got some bad advice up front and we had to come in and try to help fix it at the back end. Well, Matthew, that's, you know, that's some high level stuff and hopefully your audience is still awake um, and they didn't have to fast forward to all of it. Thanks again for inviting me and I appreciate this, uh, the time spending with you. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Interview with the Surgeon. Until next time, stay focused and keep following your dreams.